Hi, my name is Autumn Dixon, and this week is January 31st through February 6th for Come Follow Me, and we are going to be in Moses and Genesis. So for this particular video, I want to be talking about the Tower of Abel. Now, this is a relatively famous story, even beyond our own church in all of Christendom, which is interesting because it's only nine verses long. <laughs> but even in Texas, when I spoke to my friends of other faiths, pretty much everyone knew the story. Now, essentially what's happening is there are there's a group of people and they build a city and then they build a tower. And the purpose of this tower is to reach the heavens, to reach where God lives and in hopes that they cannot be scattered by the Lord to build up enough power. I think one of the things that's really important to understand about this story is that the group of people who were building this city and this tower were apostate. When you look at it in the context of Genesis, we realize that the Lord had given the gospel to the posterity of Adam. So they had some kind of knowledge of temples and temple covenants and how to actually reach God, <laughs> but they chose to do it in their own way, right? Now the Lord comes down and he sees them doing this and he is none too pleased. And so he decides to confound their language, to confuse all of their language and they are scattered. Now this story, perhaps more than just about any other story I can think of, at least in this very moment, is a perfect allegory for pride. Perfect allegory for pride. So when you are on the church website and you look into study helps, when you're looking at the word pride, this is one of the sentences from it. It says, a proud person sets himself above those around him and follows his own will rather than God's will. Okay, so that's part of the definition. They set themselves above other, other people and they follow their own will instead of God's will. <laughs> Once again, this is not, there can't be a better allegory for pride. These people are building a tower so they can literally be higher than other people. They're placing themselves above other people and they are doing it according to their own will rather than God's will. After he said, this is how you reach me with the temple, my house and these covenants, right? They are following their own will. Perfect allegory for pride. Could not have made this easier for me. Now, the Lord confounds their language, which is also so perfect. <laughs> it's poetic and how perfect it is really because the Lord could have scattered them in a million different ways, right? It would have been very easy for him to just bring in an enemy, wipe them out, whatever he wanted to do, right? It would have been very easy to take care of these people in some other way, but he chose to confound their language. And once again, allegorically speaking, when you are prideful, it is immensely difficult to understand someone else. It is very difficult to perceive others accurately, right? To know who your true friends are, to know when someone is speaking to you out of love. It is very difficult <laughs> to understand somebody when you are prideful because pride is enmity. Enmity between you and God or enmity between you and someone else. You are literally placing yourself in opposition to them, setting yourself opposed to them. And that makes it very difficult to understand them, right? So think of a situation, right? So something you are personally injured by somebody. And then after that, it is very easy to always assume malintent, right? Whenever they make a choice or they do something, you're wondering, well, are they doing this because they don't like me, right? Are they purposefully being tactless or are they rude and apathetic? If over time you're holding on to this pride, the relationship can deteriorate quickly, which is also interesting because when you read the Institute Manual for this section, it also implies that this confounding of the languages of these people who are building this tower it might have been a gradual confounding. It might not have happened overnight. They didn't necessarily wake up and look over at their spouse and all of a sudden they're talking in different languages. It might have been a gradual process. Over time, if we keep holding on to our pride and we keep building ourselves up in this tower and placing ourselves above someone else, we are going to find that it is very difficult to understand them. We leave 
when you place yourself in opposition to someone, you leave no space to wonder whether you're making a personal misjudgment or whether you have flawed thinking. You leave no room for context, whether the other person's having a bad day. There's no room for compassion, trying to understand someone, because pride doesn't allow you to step into that. Pride cuts you off from any inspiration that may help you understand another person. Now, personal story time about this situation. So sometime last year, can't remember exactly when it was, my husband and I got into a little bit of a tiff. I won't share specifics about it because context is key and it would seem really odd if if you didn't have the context. But to help you better understand the story, I will tell you this. I did something that made him feel very condescended to, like I was talking down to him and treating him like a child. And I felt like he did something that had backed me into a corner and I had very limited options. And so I made this action that felt condescending to him. And it was a really, really small thing, but it actually escalated very quickly. We had a lot of pressure on us at this point. I think a lot of things were just going wrong all at once and it escalated very quickly. (laughs) Anyway, so after we had this little tiff and we came to a standstill and we kind of stepped away from each other, he got a phone call and he went downstairs. Well, after a little bit of time, I realized that there was something that I needed to do downstairs. <laughs> and I really, really, really did not want to go downstairs because I didn't want to face him. I didn't really want to talk to him. I was still mad at him. And I knew that I was mad at him. And I knew that I would not be able to have a conversation with him if that were to be brought about if I went downstairs. However, I had this task. I needed to go downstairs. So I went downstairs and as I'm walking downstairs, I breathe a sigh of relief when I realize he's still on the phone. So I don't have to deal with it. (laughs) So I go about my little task, trying not to look at him, just kind of ignoring him while he's on the phone. And as I'm walking back upstairs, he's off the phone and he stops me, which I really didn't want to happen, but he stopped me. And I turn around and look at him and he says, I really don't like that you did that. And it might've been his tone or it might've been my perception of his tone. (laughs) but I felt scolded and I was really mad about this because I had felt backed into a corner and I felt like I did what I had to do. And now he was scolding me for it. And I was really, really mad at him him for it. And so with a little more vitriol than he's used to, I kind of spat back my perception. Yeah, well, I didn't like that you did this and got mad at him. And I didn't really see what his face looked like. I didn't really give him any time to respond. I just spun on my heel and walked back upstairs in a dramatic fashion, of course. So I walked back upstairs and we kind of walked on eggshells the rest of the day, kind of tiptoed around each other a little bit. And then the evening came and we were laying in bed. (laughs) What a great place to have a conversation because you can't really avoid each other. (laughs) Anyway, so we're laying in bed. And I can't remember who it was, but someone, either myself or him, was like, are we going to talk about this? (laughs) Because there's obviously an elephant sitting right between us. And as we started to have this conversation, he told me where he was coming from. And he shared his perception of what had happened in our little tiff. And I shared my perception of what had happened in the tiff. And everything that we were perceiving all of these scenes were grounded in previous experiences. There were reasons for all of it, right? There was context and we were able to understand each other. Now, the part that was the real kicker, the part that really got to me was as he was talking to me about what he had experienced or what he had perceived, he talked about that little moment when I had come downstairs and he had turned to me and said, what you did, like, I don't like what you did. It really bothered me and I had spat back at him, he told me that when he had said that, when he had said, I really, really don't like that you did that, he wasn't trying to scold me or get on to me. He had actually been trying to start a conversation with me because he had been questioning himself, saying, why did that bother me so much? It was such a small thing. Where did that come from? Why did I get so mad at her over this action? But because of my pride, because I was so caught up in my own opinions and because I had placed enmity between us, because I had placed myself in opposition to Connor, 
I completely misinterpreted that situation. I thought he was scolding me. And so I turned on my heel and I left and I was mad at him. I completely failed to understand him. Pride leads to a lack of understanding. Now, next part of the story. This is in Genesis. And it is chapter, let's see. It is chapter 11 and it is verse 4. Now, I really love this part of the story because I think it's ironic and I like irony. <laughs> so the people are building this story and they, they are building this tower. And the story tells us why they are building the tower. So this is Genesis chapter 11 and it is verse 4. It says, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So they're literally saying, let's build a tower so that we reach heaven, so that we can make a name for ourselves, and we can avoid being scattered upon the face of the land. Well, ironic time. Guess what happened? <laughs> you got it. They were scattered. Now, when I picture the Lord scattering this people, as I said previously, there would have been a lot of ways that the Lord could have just taken care of this little tower problem. He could have brought in armies. He could have literally picked them up and placed them other places if that was really what he had wanted to do. There were a lot of ways that he could have scattered them. But he chose to confound their language, and something tells me that they scattered themselves. If you live in one city, and you all speak a different language, and I doubt there were that many translators, if there were any translators, it makes it very difficult to live in a city together. <laughs> I cannot imagine being a ruler over a city where everyone spoke different languages and they didn't even know what I was trying to lay down the law for, right? I imagine that they scattered themselves because they didn't understand each other. The Lord didn't even have to scatter them. They were building this tower so they could avoid being scattered. And in the end, they scattered themselves. I want to bring this back to Connor. So in my situation with Connor, we had a hard time understanding each other, or at least I had a hard time understanding him. And there was a little bit of scattering, right? I was trying to avoid him and stay away from him, and I didn't even want to look at him when I went downstairs. We walked on eggshells. We kind of walked around each other all day, right? There was a little bit of scattering. And if we, if both of us had decided that we were never going to lay aside that pride and we were going to stand in opposition to each other, I can imagine that the scattering could have grown into a much larger problem. I'm so grateful that he chose to step out of his pride and to imagine what I had been feeling and to understand me. Now, if you have found yourself in a place where you don't understand your loved one, where you might as well be speaking a different language. Take hope in the fact that languages can be learned and relearned. It's not easy to learn a language. <laughs> Ask anyone who has learned language. It is not easy to learn a language. It's not something that happens overnight, right? It takes a ton of work. <laughs> and the people who learn languages best are the people who travel to the country where they speak that language and they spend time in that country, right? And if we're going along with this allegory, you are gonna learn the language best if you place yourself into their shoes and travel with them and walk with them and see life from their point of view. You will be able to better learn and to better understand them. Now, learning a language is not easy. It's especially not easy in our allegory because you are having to dig all the way down deep into your heart to let go of pride, to let go of opposition so that you can step into their shoes so that you can understand them and learn their language and where they're coming from, understand their context. It's a process, a huge process of uncovering why you feel a certain way, of trying to uncover where they're coming from, to question your knee-jerk reaction to whatever happened in the moment. It's a process to learn compassion when your loved one did mean to hurt you because they were so frustrated and upset and hurt themselves. 
It's a process to learn to give them compassion and to be understanding. It can be a process of prayer. Even if, <laughs> even if you're having a hard time even wanting to understand the other person, you can pray about that too. You can pray and say, Heavenly Father, I don't even want to understand this person, but I know you want me to. So if you could help me understand this person, it can be the entire process can be filled with prayer. It can be, even though it is a process, even though it can be very, very difficult, I can promise from personal experience that it is worth it. So even though it, when it came to me and Connor, my story with Connor, even though it started with a tiff and this difficult thing, the conversation that we had that night, I will never forget for as long as I live. My husband, I admire him so much for this. He took down his pride and he talked about how he had literally tried to place himself in my shoes to understand why I had reacted in the way that I had reacted and why I had felt backed into a corner. And that conversation is so meaningful to me. It is one of my favorite conversations I've ever had with my husband. I've never forgotten it. It is a process to learn a language and to let go of your pride so that you can understand somebody else. But it is a process that leads to the most beautiful conclusions. <laughs> and remember that even after you learn a language, even after you have learned to understand somebody, it takes practice to keep doing that, to keep remembering that language. I am grateful for my savior that speaks all languages. I am grateful for a savior who helps me to see other people as he sees them, that he can literally open my eyes and all of a sudden I get, I just, I see so much better than I did before. He just gives that spiritual gift to me. I'm grateful that he can grant the gift of tongues so that I can learn and understand them, understand their language. I'm grateful for a savior who died for me and who suffered for me so that when I make mistakes and I stand in my own pride, <laughs> he's paid the price for that so that I can return to live with him. I'm grateful for the price he paid for my husband so that I could live with my loving husband forever as well. I know that all of that is because of my savior, Jesus Christ. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.